What do you think the meaning of life is? I mean, why do you think you're here? Why do you think you're sitting in this car at the moment? Or why do you think you're sitting in your office? Or if you're at home, what's the point of your life? Uh, where do you think it's going? Uh, where do you think you've come from? And uh, most of us say, I, I just haven't a clue. I'm just bewildered. I really don't know why I'm here at all. And in fact, I can't see how anyone on this earth can possibly tell that because we are part of the system itself. We're within this fixed planet that we have. And uh, unless we get off it far enough uh, so that we can find out what is in the rest of space, I don't see how we can ever tell uh, why we're here. Either we have to get off and find out what's beyond space and get some information on what is out there, or if it's all too much beyond us, and it does seem to be, if it's all too much beyond us, then somehow or other whatever is out there and whatever caused all this has to come in and invade our planet and has to let us know what it's all about. And as far as I can see, all we've got in that area is space fiction and uh, movies like Star Wars. But I can't really see any evidence that anything beyond this earth has ever come to the earth to explain to us what all this was in aid of. What we have been saying is that though many people have claimed to be that invasion from outer space, and though there are many great religious leaders who have all proclaimed that they knew what the earth was created for and they actually had communications with the being that created it, yet what we've been sharing is uh, there is only one event that is really convincing in that kind of realm. And that's the event that took place in the first century of our era. And of course, the reason we say that is that uh, so many of the religious leaders were just men like us. Muhammad was a man like us. Uh, Buddha was a man like us. Uh, the Hindu religious leaders were men like we are. They died like dogs and they were buried and that was the end of them. But there is an incredible human being that lived in the first century of our era that is different in quality from all the rest of us. He did not d die like a dog in the sense that he was not just buried and he was forgotten. He actually uh, had some power to destroy even death. And he lived in the first century of our era. Now, of course, you and I are so used to hearing his name and so used to using his name even as a swear word that we have kind of written it off as a lot of myth and a lot of legend, but it isn't. It isn't at all. Actually, the reason we know about him is because we have some of the most reliable history in our world that is written about him. And that history, you remember, is contained in a book that we've often referred to in great uh, state occasions or in times when one of our relatives dies or one of the babies is christened, uh, it is really a book uh, or a collection of books known as Ta Biblia in Greek. Biblia is the Greek word for the books. So it's actually known as the books. And uh, we, of course, know it in our British and Western tradition as the Bible. It's actually just the last quarter of that book that we're talking about here on this program because it's the last quarter of the book that records the history of the events, the remarkable events that took place in the first century of our era when the supreme being beyond the universe invaded the earth, came into the earth and came in in a way that shows us that it is undoubtedly him. And so that's why we're examining that record. And one of the things that we've shared is that it is not just history, but it is reliable history. Uh, some people have talked about the history of Muhammad's life, but actually it is so covered over with all kinds of legends and myths that were written hundreds of years later, as is the life of Buddha, that you cannot distinguish between the history and the imaginative uh, inventions that surround it. Whereas the history of the first century of our era is recorded in this last quarter of the book called the Bible 
in such stark and plain and substantiated terms that you know it's history. And of course, one of the factors that reinforces that is that the men that wrote it were actually alive when the events took place. And that, you remember, is what Peter says. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says that in a letter that he wrote to some friends. He actually wrote three letters, and, and this is the, or two letters, and this is the second letter. And uh, it's actually called in our Bible, Second Peter, if you uh, get hold of a Bible and, uh, and look it up. It's uh, Second Peter and chapter 1 and verse 16. And that's what he said. We didn't follow cleverly devised myths. We didn't make these things up. We were actually with this man, Jesus, on the mountain. We heard a voice coming from heaven. We heard this voice from outer space. And don't say we're mystics. I'm not a mystic. I'm an ordinary fisherman. Don't call me a mystic. I'm an ordinary guy, an ordinary man who earns his bread by the sweat of his brow. But I was on the mountain when this voice came. I saw him. I saw it happen. And of course, you and I are very prone to say, well, that's him himself saying that. But how do we know he was an eyewitness? Well, the fact is that many other books were written about that same era that are not included in the book called the Bible. There are all kinds of books. There's a book called the Epistle of Barnabas. There's a book called the Clementine Letters. There's a, another book called the Didache. There are about 20 or 30 other books that were written about this same era that aren't in the Bible at all. And they make all kinds of references to Peter and show that he was alive at that time and he was known as a public figure at that time. In fact, that's why Paul, you remember, said to uh, King Agrippa when he was being examined himself, he said, these things, the king knows about these things, for this was not done in a corner. In other words, the whole ancient world knew about this man, Jesus, and knew the events that were taking place. It was well known. And the writings of men like Clement and Barnabas and Ignatius in the first century are filled with references to the written records of the men who observed Jesus firsthand. So actually, we know that these men were eyewitnesses because they were well-known figures in that era and were referred to by all kinds of other historians that did not write and whose writings were not included in the book called the Bible. But there are other reasons for believing this. Uh, probably one of the greatest is that this man, Peter, of course, died for what he wrote. He died for what he wrote. He didn't uh, gain a lot from it, you know. He wasn't benefited greatly by it. He didn't become rich and famous. He was actually hung upside down on a cross and crucified. So when you suggest that uh, he was not telling the truth when he said we did not follow cleverly devised myths, then you have to justify why would he tell a lie which would bring about his death. Uh, there is in that a logical and psychological problem because no man will devise a deliberate lie that will bring about his own death. He'll at least give up on the lie in order to save his own skin. So when we begin to look at the historicity of the events that took place in the first century, we need to see that they were written by actual eyewitnesses. They are not myths or imaginations that are created years after the event. They were actually written at the very time these events were taking place, and they were written by men who were alive at that time. Have we any connection with these men apart from this book, the Bible? Yes, we have. And we'll talk about that tomorrow.